Oh, conclusions. Over the six experiments, distant group intention in a blinded experimental design was associated with increased growth of barley seeds in targeted versus non-targeted seeds. Secondly, this effect could not be explained in terms of random selection of the targeted seeds over the experiments. Third, over the six experiments, distant group intention was associated with overall increased barley growth in targeted, non-targeted seeds compared with matched non-intention control sessions. Just in general, those seeds grew more. Now, because this comparison was not blinded, a possible experiment effect cannot be ruled out. However, a, quote, anomaly or unexpected effect in the data emerged, um, which had to do with the last experiment, which was the Austin experiment. It turned out that was the only experiment where the non-intended day seeds overall were higher than the targeted seeds and non-targeted seeds in the intention day. And it turned out that it was during that period of time that we were breaking the laboratory down in the last couple of days for a construction to take place, which meant there was other energy in the room, sound and, uh, and so on. And, uh, and that's the one case where there was a reversal to what the, what the other uh, groups showed, suggesting that even if there was an experiment effect, it could be also be affected by other environmental factors. And we'll see, by the way, um, in, in tomorrow, when Joey Jones presents, the, uh, the environment of the laboratory energetically can have effect on uh, living systems. Now, the large magnitude targeted effect in the healing touch practitioner experiment, coupled with the absence of a spread of effect and tension effect, further suggests the importance of distant group um, intention. One of the things that's, that's very interesting about distant group intention is that implicitly it's, it's talking about some of the implications that Claude Swanson talks about with regard to synchronization. And because when you have multiple individuals simultaneously putting their intention on a given object, one could speculate that the group would have greater effects um, through uh, some sort of a coherence or synchronized action. Conclusions. Um, obviously, the, quote, opportunistic aspect of these six experiments um, is not ideal. On the other hand, they point out that these effects may apply in the real world, at least the real world of conferences. Um, secondly, adding a second blinded experiment or, uh, would make it possible to run blinded control sessions as well. In other words, if we, if we do this kind of work in the future um, we, and we have two experimenters and they don't know on a given weekend what, which, whether it's, it's going to be an intention experiment or not, then we can address the, uh, the spread of effect effect. Now, a lot of questions to address, including distance, number of intenders in a group, the type of group, such as healers and so on running skeptic groups, which I really want to try someday, and controls. And finally, I'd just like to share that we, we've become very interested in the nature of water itself. Um, and as you know, there, are, there have been studies. In fact, Glenn's going to be talking shortly about, about intentionality in water. And the question arises, what happens if intention, instead of being sent to the seeds, is going to be sent to water that's going to nourish the seeds? And then that water is then given to the seeds uh, and of course, the seeds have not been selected until after the water has been energized, so there isn't a confound there. Can we find that at least some of this effect is actually affecting the structure or the energy of that which makes up all living systems, which is, uh, which is water itself? Um, I must confess, by the way, that when I started these experiments, um, well, despite having published a book summarizing a lot of research with local or you know, fairly local, you know, within feet um, in intentionality, um, I was very surprised by the um, potential robustness of, a, of potential distance and tension effects on, um, on living systems. Thank you. If we have questions, uh, you're the first person uh, in the, with the tie. would be between a local and a non-local experiment? Is it really better when you're close? Um, well, looking at these data, remember there was only six experiments, and we looked at the distance effect and we also, potential distance effect, we also looked at the potential 
you know, N of the group, 100 versus 500 or 600 intenders. Um, and there were certainly no statistical differences and no significant correlations. But again, you're only dealing with an N of six. So I really can't speak to that. As far as I'm concerned, it's an open question. Are, are we measuring uh, growth or how fast they're growing? The th the, this engineer's uh, thing comes to mind is, uh, you know, there's lots of people in this world who need more food. And is this, an, uh, is, is this a way to get a higher yield of barley? I think that would be the pragmatic uh, future work. But had you, had you addressed whether it's just the speed of growth or the actual uh, uh, something else. Well, the way that we've measured, measured it is a one-time measurement after it's grown for five days. So from, in that way, you would say you could call it a speed of growth effect because they're growing more robustly. But whether it's speed or just greater vitality, you know, that becomes a, that becomes a theoretical question. But if the practical question is if you can get more barley to grow in a quicker period of time for the same amount of resources, that's a valuable thing for our society and for the world. Uh, Gary, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the name Bill Sweet. Bill Sweet wrote a book called A Journey Into Prayer about two Christian scientists that wanted to prove that prayer worked. This is in the 60s. And uh, they started doing research exactly or s similar to what you're talking about. They knew there was a placebo effect. They knew that was with humans. And so they wanted to use something that would not, you know, the placebo effect would not inter interfere with. They got the same kind of results you're reporting here over and over again, but they were rejected both by their religious community and by academia and their scientific community. I, I imagine uh, Larry Dossie knows more about this and I hope he'll speak about it, but uh, they ended up, uh, after years finally starting to be accepted, ended up committing suicide, the two of them together. Really? Yes, sir. I, I suggest you Check that book out, though. I'm probably glad that I didn't know about this before I started the research, because <laughs> I have no interest in following in their footsteps. Um, you know, it's a challenge if you do any of this with any particular religious persuasion. If I did this as a fundamentalist Christian, or a Christian scientist, or a Muslim, or a Jewish person, or whatever, I would immediately be getting in, I think, even more trouble than just doing this in a, quote, secular fashion. Hi. Uh, we have a uh, seed testing laboratory, and we've done some of this kind of work uh, here in the uh, Denver area. Hmm. And one, of the, and I, we can talk about. It, but one of the questions I wanted to ask you is: Did you notice any increased uh, actual germination percentage? Did more seeds actually germinate in the in the trials uh, where there was intention? The answer is. It looked that way, but since most of our seeds germinated with this procedure, there isn't much room for variability in that sense, okay? Um, so it, it, this is not the preparation in which you'd want to look at rate of germination, because almost all the seeds germinate, you know, a good eight, 85 to 90 percent. Um, but yes, it's a very good question. Thank you.